Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, I'm especially excited tonight. I have a couple of announcements I want to make and uh, that before uh, before we get into the actual study. Uh, tonight, we're, uh, it's the second study that uh, on 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're in chapter 1. Tonight, we'll begin with verse 11. But before we get into that, uh, let's do our normal uh, introductions and uh, conversation. Uh, uh, first, uh, let me have uh, Sister Renee, who we lovingly call the Untwisted Sister. Say hi to everybody. Hey, guys. I love my term of endearment. It's better than Jezebel. Oh, yes. Yeah. Jezebel. Yes. She's yeah. not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to take it. Uh, this is Renee Rowland, channel of the same name. I contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. The message of Christ that uh, he died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And because of that, we have eternal life as a free gift. That is the good news of the gospel. And it's been lost under miles and piles of religion uh, over the years. That's what happens when you throw man into the mix. He can mess up something so simple as a free gift to make it complicated. So we contend for that. And Brother Luke calls me the untwisted sister because I like to untwist verses people use out of context to cause fear instead of edifying and giving joy and peace and spiritual growth to the, the reader. Um, and when we read the Bible, we should be lifted up, edified, encouraged to serve, encouraged to go on, not uh, fall apart in fear and condemnation. So that's what I do, and it's good to be with you guys tonight. I'm loving the Pauline epistles uh, that we're studying. Right. Yeah, this is fantastic. Yep, and we've just begun. We finished Romans. I hope uh, if you did not see the, the study on Romans, I hope you'll take the time to go back and watch that in its entirety. It's one of the most important books in the Bible. Uh, it, it has some amazing essential truths it also has some potential pitfalls. If you don't get it right, you can go horribly wrong. So please go back and watch the study we did on Romans. And now we're in 1 Corinthians. We'll work our way through these Pauline epistles. <clears throat> now, uh, Brother Cripps. Uh, yeah. Hey, hi, sure, everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. And we come on Sunday nights at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we like to just uh, have conversations. A lot of topics are involved with uh, normal life stuff. And uh, we welcome everyone the, to the table without division, without uh, fighting or backbiting, and try to just have a polite conversation. We've actually proved uh, that we can do that, even uh, though we have an unbeliever, someone that admits that he doesn't believe on the panel. And um, he asks us uh, other believers questions and we try to answer them and we involve people in the chat and it's just really, really a, a great time. Uh, so, um, but I also am a part of this broadcast every Wednesday, which is to my delight and edification to be a part of these wonderful Bible studies. I also am excited about uh, the Pauline epistles, just like Renee is. And uh, this one, we've, we've, you've only missed one show. If you haven't uh, had a chance to go back and watch it, uh, definitely watch last week's show, too. And uh, I'm excited. And hello to the chat. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so let's, let's say hi to the chat room. That's the, our, our congregation, the fellowship. Uh, I know some people are, you're not involved in the chat room. You're just either listening or you watch the upload. Uh, welcome to, to all of you. If it's your first time with us, uh, I hope you have a great experience with us tonight, and maybe you want to join us for all of our programs. Uh, we have a live program Wednesday nights, Friday nights, and also Sunday. We have our church program that starts at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So I invite you to join us for all of those. And if you want to participate in the chat room, that's great. Uh, we try to acknowledge the people in the chat room. We have some people with a little symbol of a wrench next to their name. That means they're a moderator, so they're kind of uh, handling the activity in the chat room for us, because we can't really, Renee and Cripps and I, uh, it's hard for us to really uh, 
monitor the chat room as, as we're trying to do the study. So um, welcome. Uh, thank you to the moderators. And I will ask, uh, remind everybody that in, in the chat room, please, uh, this is a Bible study, uh, a study the Bible along with us tonight. Uh, the chat room should be used to discuss the subject that we're discussing tonight rather than going off on other uh, subjects or uh, even though maybe you have some other interests, please try to stay on the subject with us. Uh, okay, now I, I sent Renee and Cripps a little message on their phones today, kind of te a teaser saying I, I'm really, really especially excited about tonight's program because I'm going to do something for the very first time that is, um, I, I think everybody's going to be uh, as excited as I am about it. Some may not, though. Um, I got into a wonderful conversation with Brother Leo Larson last night, and uh, um, he filled me in on his own uh, progress in his, his private Bible studies. And I, I just have to commend him. I hope everybody will do the same thing. He's really gotten into the Word over the last year. And I think he's, uh, Brother Michael, Ultimate Mordecai, has been a good influence on him. Uh, so Brother Leo, is, he's, he's really looking at everything a second time, looking at the Greek and looking at other translations. And uh, so, so where uh, he tells me that he found another translation that has just blown his mind. And he says, you'll be shocked to learn the origin of the translation or who, who produced it. I'll save that for... Um, a little bit later, but the, the translation is called the New American Bible Revised Edition. And, uh, we are discussing it, and not only does it have uh, the, the translation that is uh, going to be very helpful, but it's full of footnotes. It has a, a footnote on almost every verse. And the footnotes give you some kind of historical context that, that's also helpful. Um, so the, the, I, I'm not going to go into the whole conversation I had with him last night, but with some really interesting things were revealed from the, to, to him on these footnotes. Um, but we're going to incorporate that to our program tonight. So you, as you, if you've been following along with these studies, you know that we read the KJV first. I think all, all three of us uh, have hold the position. Uh, we're KJV firstists. <laughs> I used to be KJV onlyist for 25 years, and but I still want to read the KJV first, and and I test all the the other translations against it. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's, that language and that at that time and place in history is is not really our native tongue, and it can be a little confusing since it's our nat not our natural way of speaking today. So I find it helpful to look at other translations. So it, it's routinely what I've done is I read the KJV first, we discuss it, and then we look at the Amplified Translation, which is one that I think is very helpful. So you've probably noticed that we look at the KJV and we look at the Amplified quite often, and sometimes the Amplified quite helpful. Well, we're going to add a third translation in the discussion beginning tonight, and it's the New American Bible Revised Edition, uh, and, and also take advantage of their footnotes. So uh, let's see how, how that goes. Uh, and do you have any thoughts on there? Are you familiar with it, uh, Renee or, or Cripps? Uh, no, sir. All good. Okay. All right. So let's uh, begin now. I'll read it first in the KJV. We're in, uh, oh, by the way, uh, one of the things that came out in the last week's study, besides the introduction to the book, uh, who, what, where, when, all those things that are important to realize to get the context of uh, who wrote it and why they wrote it, all that. Uh, but when we got into the text itself, we were able to get through 10 verses. And Brother Cripps saw something that was really amazing. And that is that each of the first 10 verses, it references Jesus Christ. So it all, 10 times it's saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, that we should learn something from that. Yeah. Paul is saying ten times, Jesus, focus on Jesus. It's about Jesus. And that's why I call myself a Christian. I'm not a Christian. What does that mean? If you ask them what a Christian is, they're not gonna there's you're gonna get a dozen different answers. What's a Christian? Yeah. 
you ask them what a Christian is, they're not going to know, but it gives you the opportunity of saying, well, a Christian is a person who relies completely on Jesus Christ for their salvation. Amen. A Christian is someone who knows it's all about Christ and not about them. A Christian is the, the Christianity that we find in the Bible. Okay? Uh, so I think that is demonstrated in the first 10 verses, how Paul uses Jesus Christ in every verse in the first 10 verses. Hmm. Now we move to verse 11. Let's see if the string continues. Verse 11, Paul writes, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Hmm. Now, I'll stop there. Uh, remember in the uh, the introduction to this book we did last week, uh, we, we, we said that there are basically five points, uh, the reasons that he's writing this letter. And he, Paul established the church in Corinth. Uh, and and he, he, he basically, he lived there for about a year and a half. He got very close to them. And, and then he, he's moved away and, and, and now he's in Ephesus writing this letter because he's notified uh, there's all kinds of problems going on in that church. So he's writing a letter to address five problems. And uh, go back to the um, introduction last week to get that overview. But right here, this verse is starting off talking about how he he's, needs to contact them because of these contentions. So uh, Sister Renee... Uh, yes, I've been so, waiting to get to this one. Go ahead. Uh, I have read a few things when I first started this ministry. I wanted to get an understanding. I was confused at some of the letters, the pastoral letters, and what they said about women. So I had to learn what they meant in context. Unfortunately, many men won't research that any further because they like what it appears to say on the surface. However, when you look at Paul's letters, uh, you see that he has very much affection and respect and endearment for women in the ministry, calling Phoebe even a deacon. It's the same uh, word used for the men, but for some reason they translate it minister for the women and deacons for the men instead of deaconess. So in this case, it was very common. I wanted to read here. Chloe more than likely ran a house church uh, and he was obviously someone that was in good standing and uh, uh, was a woman of position. And uh, one of the things I wanted to read, it says, Paul did not have a problem with godly, well-behaved women speaking, praying, and prophesying aloud in church meetings. Look at 1 Corinthians 11.5. He did not even have a problem with women being a house church leader. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Paul sends greetings from Achilla and Priscilla to the Corinthian church. From what we know, Priscilla, it's incomprehensible to think she didn't speak, teach, pray, or prophesy in church meetings that met in her own home. Yeah. And it's a shame that the examples of Priscilla, Chloe, and other New Testament women, as well as Paul's verses about mutuality, such as 1 Corinthians 11, 11, and 12, are not given the same degree of emphasis as the other ones, like suffer not a woman, and all those verses are used. Because uh, we're supposed to take the full counsel of God. What Paul had a problem with were, one, false teachers, women coming in from the fertility cults yep. in that area. Uh, remember, great is goddess Diana of the Ephesians? Well, all that fertility stuff came into the church. He has a problem with uh, a woman named Jezebel, who we see in Revelation, that was teaching false. Um, he has a problem with idolatry and temple prostitution and women gossiping and idle chatter and causing confusion and talking on top of one another. He does not have a problem with godly, educated, well-informed women doing anything in the church. As a matter of fact, he sends Phoebe to read his letters to the people. I'm assuming she had to speak in order to read them. So um, I just wanted to say, this not because i care to change men's minds because they're going to believe what they want but i've seen some women feel condemned for listening to me because somebody told them it was wrong to to learn anything from a woman but there is no male or female in christ 
I am not the head of, of a church. I am not a pastor. I'm a sister in Christ and we are learning together. And I just wanted to show you that Paul's uh, full uh, report and understanding and ideas about women are not being explained in the churches. So we need to read these verses in context and realize they were addressing very specific problems in that church. Amen. It was not a generalization that God won't use women at all to do anything at all. It's ludicrous. So, um, we see here that the house of Chloe, this was more than likely based on the plethora of historical research out that this is uh, against what men want to believe the men that were putting this together. It was probably a house church run by a woman named Chloe. They even went so far to try to say Chloe was a place because they didn't want to admit a woman ran a house church. They tried to say Chloe was a place, but it's clear it's a lady that's the head of a house church and she is of some good standing and rapport and some sort of leadership because she is the one reporting the contentions going on in the church. So I wanted to make that clear and I have no agenda. I just want people to really understand the position because some, you know, the more Christian, more women converted to Christianity than any other religion in the first century, despite it being the most persecuted religion. You could lose your life. And there was a reason for that. Um, so uh, hopefully that gave some people some uh, historical background. OK, uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified before Brother Cripps uh, speaks. For I have been informed about you, my brothers and sisters, by those of Chloe's household, that there are quarrels and factions among you. Brother Cripps? Yeah, I'll, I'll take my time uh, just really quickly to say that I agree with everything Renee is saying. And I think it's uh, preposterous that these people are coming against her when um, all she does is, is contend for things of faith. That's all she does. And, and anyone that's seen one of her videos knows exactly what purpose she serves in doing that. And that God uses her videos to reach people that need to be reminded of who they are in Christ and to stand firm in him. Um, and uh, I, I agree that uh, what these verses are saying, and I agree that people take out of context. She said something very important in that. We need to look at all of Scripture, the whole of Scripture, the common paraphrase. This is the Crips paraphrase. But we need to look at the context of the whole of Scripture, not just cherry-picked verses, and not back them up by reading the whole chapter and reading the book that they're encased in. Um, anyway, I'll say that. And there's, uh, um, I can't wait to see what contentions Paul's talking about coming up. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to uh, read this uh, for the third time in that uh, New American Bible revised edition. It says, for it has been reported to me about you my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. And I'll go on and continue into verse 12, continue the thought. I don't need to say anything uh, more than All you right. guys said about verse 11. So I'm going to read, continue reading this in verse 12, but in the NAB. Uh, I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Uh, I'll read that in the KJV and see how it compares. Um, it says, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Apollos, and I of, of I mean, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Uh, so, um, Brother Cripps? Uh, yeah, he's just talking about the different things he's heard from other, or, or not heard. I say this, that every one of you say, oh, they do say it. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Um, 
I need more to go on, really. I don't think there's a whole lot I can say about that, but he's he's okay. about to lay some uh, stuff down. Let, let me talk then, because I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very eager to talk about this. Excellent. I, I think this next part, this verse and the con next few verses, this relates to why he said in verses 1 through 10, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see, today we hear people say, I belong to Calvin. I belong to Luther. Ooh. I belong to the Pope. Whatever. Yeah. You can even pick MacArthur, Piper, Washer, if you want to be more contemporary uh, on a smaller scale. Stanley. But, yeah. So uh, this is happening, and Paul is, is pointing this out as... Uh, the first problem he's addressing uh, of the, the five problems you, we're going to go over here in this church. This first one is this identifying with uh, a Christian, even though they are prominent, who's more prominent than Cephas, which is another name for Peter, the mm -hmm. apostle Peter. So some are identifying as that they're, 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 they're really disciples of Peter. Mm. They're disciples of, of of Apollos. Apollos has really become prominent now. You know, I wasn't he the one that uh, 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 was it Chloe or somebody had to correct him because he didn't have the right understanding of the gospel. I think it might have been Apollos. Renee, I think you know that. But um, at this point, Apollos has become very prominent. And he's a leader in the in the church community, just like we have we have leaders in our uh, grace community here on the internet, and some people align themselves with them. And this is a problem because Paul is saying, "You're you got this all wrong. It's about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Don't think it's about which teacher, which." which uh, apostle or which church leader that you are affiliated with. It doesn't matter who, which one, who baptized you or who taught you. Remember, it's about Christ and you, not. All right, so um, Renee. Yeah, it looks like uh, the spirit was already going in there trying to make denominations right off the start. Mm. There, there's only one church of Jesus Christ. And we're all in that body. But you can see how many Episcopalian, Methodist, Lutheran, Calvin. You see all of these denominations. And we should all be of like mind. We should have all the same foundation. And it, it, if the foundation isn't in the same, isn't the same in all these churches, then somebody's wrong. And yep. one of them's right. Yep. So that's pretty scary to think about. But the devil's been trying up front to divide the body of Christ because there's power in the body of Christ. There's power in the real church. The Catholic claims to be the true church. It's not. Uh, the, the Catholic church has zero in common with first century churches that were set up in the Near East by Paul. Nothing at all. So right here, they're trying to divide off, like, like Brother Luke said, based on who taught them and who baptized them right there. Let me respond to Hendricks, Brother Hendricks in the chat room here. He makes an important point, and it's a, it is a, uh, a distinction that matters. He says the difference between Peter, Paul, Apollos versus Luther, Calvin, etc., is that the first three preached the same gospel. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Amen. But, but. Paul, even though they're preaching the same gospel, Paul is still pointing out you have a problem. Yep. Yep. You have a problem. Even if they're preaching, teaching the right gospel, you thinking that you are a, a, a belonging, as it says in the KJV, you're of Peter. Yep. Uh, the Amplified says, you here, the Amplified says, now I mean this, that each one of you says, I am a disciple of Paul or I am a disciple of Apollos, or I am a disciple of Cephas, which is Peter, or I am a disciple of Christ. So in the Amplified, it clarifies this, that they're referring to themselves as a disciple, a follower, that that person is their teacher. And, uh, and then in the uh, NAV, it says uh, that you belong to them. You belong to their, uh, let's say, their 
little sect mm -hmm. sect of of, uh, of uh, like you have a the, the congregation and you have a sub sect within the a congregation a little clique uh you belong to that clique that's with uh, apollos or peter or so on so uh, Hendrick, you're you you make a valid point but it doesn't matter paul is still saying this is a serious problem even though they're preaching the real gospel renee go ahead yeah i i love the point you're making is that the focus should be on christ yep it's all this is where churches get into error and in division oh. their eyes off jesus it's yep. how they get into false doctrine it's how they get onto another gospel it's how they they break up into factions because their eyes are not on christ and instead instead of being united in one body many members of the same body now we're breaking off and it, the focus must be on jesus at all times That's how I was going to okay um let me read the the footnotes on uh verse 12 um, from the NAB, I belong to, uh, which is the activities of Paul and Apollos in Corinth are described in Acts 18. Uh, Cephas, such as the rock, a name which Paul designates Peter, also in Corinthians 3.22, 9.5 and 15.5 and in Galatians 1.18 and 2.9 and 11 and 14 may well have passed through Corinth. So it's saying that Peter very well has spent some time in Corinth. That's why that they're familiar with, with him. And um, uh, he could have baptized some members of the community. So they're speculating that uh, maybe Peter baptized some of the, the members in the, the Corinthian church, either there or elsewhere. Uh, the reference to Christ may be intended uh, ironically here. The reference to Christ may be intended ironically here. I'm not sure what they mean by that. But uh, what I don't understand, uh, maybe you have some thoughts on this, is he's, in a way, uh, we know that it's about Jesus. He says Jesus 10 times, and then he says, this, hey, some are identifying with Peter or Paulus or Paul, or, but and some are identifying with Christ. But uh, it's almost like, well, take your pick. You know, uh, um, he, I, I wish he had said it that when he says in verse uh, 12, um, and, and I of Christ. Oh, he says, I of Christ. I don't think oh, that. Okay, okay. Um, in the KJV, he says, uh, that might be, uh, could that be Paul? Paul saying, and I of Christ, that he is one that's saying uh, he's with Christ, he identifies with Christ, or is it Christ is one of the factions? So some are identifying with Christ, some are identifying with Peter or Paul or or Apollos. Uh, let me. I, I think the, some of the apostles, like Peter, I was with Jesus's ministry, I was with Paul's ministry, I was with Apollos's ministry. Like some of the apostles are still alive that walked with Jesus and his earthly ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just, uh, I know, but, but Paul is making the point that you should not be identifying with a, another Christian. Now there's one name above all names. It's Christ. That's why we are Christians. We identify with Christ uh, and people who, have to have a, another identification as part of another let's say, sect of Christians, which are called Lutherans or Calvinists, uh, I think this should really uh, point out to, to everybody that you are not supposed to be doing that. Fritz, I hear you sighing. You must want to say something. I always want to say something. Um yeah, the, uh, I want to go back to something uh, Renee said because I think it's very poignant and I, I think it makes a point. What if we all were of one mind? What if what if all the believers weren't separated and trying to to desperately scour the internet or 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 scour our communities to find one church that preaches just the actual gospel and nothing else and focuses on Christ? I mean, the impact that we could have in this world. Now, we I'm not talking about kingdom building here. 
I'm just saying that it would be a way different world if we were all of one mind. If there wasn't denomination, do people go out to any church and know that they're going to get just the true gospel and not <clears throat> nothing else? What an impact that would have. Um, I, I agree with what Renee said about this. He's just separating the different factions out. Um, and I'm chomping at the bit to get to verse 13 because there's uh, 13 and onward. There, He's yeah. he's going to get to the point finally. Yeah. Now, we're, we talk about the, the divisions in church today. Um, uh, I've, I've read that there are over 30,000 denominations of uh, Christianity. And then someone else to recently corrected me. Oh, no, it's much more than that. But in I'm not sure what the number is. But 30,000 or even much more right. denominations or sects or forms or versions of Christianity. Why is that? Um, in this case here, as Hendricks pointed out, it's not, they're not dividing over the, the teaching that we're not aware of. Paul is teaching a different gospel. Peter's not. Peter taught uh, the uh, Cornelius and, and, and also in, in, uh, in we actually have two sermons of, of preacher word uh, of Peter word for word. If you study those sermons, you can give that same those same sermons today, and it's a real gospel message. The content is the same as the sermon that Paul, that we have of Paul. Paul, there's there's one actual word for word sermon Paul Paul gives, and they're the same message. Uh, so I, I think that Hendricks is right that the the, the, the reason they're these factions are it's not because of doctrinal differences. It's it's identifying with a person for some reason, and um, maybe it's personality. Uh, we are we are going to bring that up uh, a little bit because of Paul Paul's personality and his mannerisms and his uh, artfulness or writing but not speaking, and uh, so that that is a factor. Um, but in this case, uh, in, the, in the world today, these divisions are basically because of dogmas. Now, you know that in our congregation, what we call the, the Church of the Eternally Secure, uh, we repeat over and over again that we have three dogmas. A dogma is a, a taking a doctrinal position on something that is absolute and no compromise can be allowed. You have to agree with this doctrine. And there's three doctrine, three dogmas, these part we call the core doctrines or the essentials. And, uh, but then let's say that there's, there are actually a hundred subjects in the Bible. I don't know if we try to figure it out, how many different subjects or theological subjects or questions are there uh, that we could, uh, people have take a position uh, A or B on. Uh, well, let's say that there's a hundred. So we are only insisting that you agree with us on three things out of our hundred possible things. The other 97% of it, everything, we say, we all have liberty. We don't have to agree on all these other things. But we, we are dogmatic and say that there are three things that rise to such a level of importance that there can be no compromise, there can be no freedom. We have to agree on these three things. Um, but uh, the problem in the church throughout history has been that every time there's a disagreement on one of these 97 other things, they cannot tolerate it and they break away and form another group. Mm -hmm. And they then within that group, there's another dissension that comes up and they break away from another. And now we have over 30,000 of these disputes that cause a division and another sect. Uh, before I go on, any want to say anything about that, Renee or Cripps? Uh, yeah, I, I have grown up. I was part of a church that I really, really loved. And there was a break in the church and they were split off. And I remember my grandfather, who was a deacon in that church, and my grandmother painfully trying to to get through that process because they they saw some of their friends wanting to go with the, the new the new church and other of their friends wanting to stay with the church that was was established. And yeah, they, they couldn't stop it. They couldn't do anything. They just had to watch and, and wonder. And it was incredibly painful. Um, and I don't even remember, I was too young to remember what it was that they were uh, dividing on. 
I just remember the devastation that it caused. Um, it, 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 this can all be avoided by uh, really, really focusing on what's important in the word. And, uh, and well, like you've done, Brother Luke, and in, in, uh, in, in your particular church, um, Church of the Eternally Secure, and picking the few things, the three things that you need to agree on, and then giving liberty in the other areas, the other areas that uh, don't turn into point of contention. It's, it, we can disagree on some of the other stuff, but these foundational things. Um, I'll be honest with you. I would love to go to a, to a building and meet with other believers in my area where we all believe the same thing on the essentials. I would love that, but it doesn't exist. So I have to go elsewhere and get it. And I'm not complaining just about me. I'm just saying um, it, it would be nice if we could all just just agree on the essentials and give liberty on the on the non-essentials. And uh, but I, I love being a part of this particular church. And uh, if if I can't find a, a brick and mortar church where I can fellowship face to face with other believers, then at least I have this at least for now. So, hey, uh, Luke, yeah. I wanted to mention something on the structure of the of the churches. It was never meant when Paul went out and started churches. He starts several churches. Now they would help each other as sister churches, but there was no one man over all those churches. Neither were we instructed to set up a kingdom that rules over all, that has a headquarters like the Catholic Church that rules over all the other churches in the world. Nowhere. There was never supposed to be a human being on the top of that pyramid that's over all the churches. Paul would start a church set up leaders in that church just for that church. Then that leader would talk to other leaders of their churches and they would work together as brothers. But there was no human being. Jesus Christ himself is the high priest. He is the head of the church. There is no uh, human government over the body of Christ. The local church is biblical. The local independent church that start, that's founded and continued in its independence. I just wanted to say that's the way churches were biblically set up, not to have some headquarters with one man having all that power over all the other churches. It was never set up like that. Yeah. Um, the uh, There's a, a name in Revelation, uh, Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans uh, is the people that were wanted to establish a governmental hierarchy and, and uh, do what you said should not be done is, is that look we're all supposed to be equal and uh, there are uh, there, there are definitions of uh, you know pastors and elders and there's teachers and um, but um, there's no hierarchy like um, cardinals and popes and stuff that rule over well, you rule over not only this congregation, but the whole city of congregations. And then another person rules over 10 cities of congregations. And then this Pope rules over all the congregations of the world. Uh, that's That was the system that the Nicolaitans were establishing that Jesus spoke against. This kind of, the the laity is was supposed to be um, not under the thumb of some like authority and government uh, hierarchy church but the Nicolaitans and then the Roman religion Roman Catholic religion they uh, this they wanted to impose this distinction between the, the clergy and the laity it should never have happened uh, so Rene I'm gonna read verse 13 now in the KJV is Christ divided was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul Okay. Oh, man. I, I love that. Br bringing it back to who the attention needs to be on. Thank you. It, it's all about Jesus. All about. It's great. It's great. Some of you were in Christ earthly ministry. It's great. Some of you were uh, followers of Peter. It's great that Apollo taught some. It's great that I did. But this isn't about us. We are all members of one body. Yes. One's the hand, one's the eye. You know, 
the body is Christ. Yep. It's got to be Christ. And I, I love how he's always bringing it back to him. Okay. Brother Chris, let me read 13 in the Amplified for you. Please, please. Uh, it says, um, has Christ been divided into different parts? Hmm. Was, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Certainly not. Okay. Yeah, so the answer to the question is no. Christ wasn't divided. Paul was not crucified for anyone uh, and weren't baptized in the name of Paul. Um, but there are people out there, and, and uh, Brother Luke, you've talked on this more than once, and you have uh, videos on this very topic, Paul, uh, people that worship Paul, people that put Paul in the place of Christ, people that even say that you can't get saved by, by the Gospels or any other part of uh, Scripture except for Paul's epistles. So if it was a problem back then, we definitely can see why, why these things were addressed by Paul, even back then, and it's still a problem now. Still a problem of people focusing on other people, just like the point we're making. Um, different pastors that are, that are set up in places of power, and uh, they're, they're worshiping the person rather than who they should be worshiping, which is Christ. And this is a great point that he's making. So... This is Paul even saying that you weren't crucified in my name. You're crucified in Christ's name. Christ wasn't divided. We're all supposed to focus on him. And again, that's what you pointed out, Brother Luke, at the beginning, was last week that all 10 verses were, were getting us prepared for where the focus needs to be. And again, if it was a problem back then, we certainly know it's going to be a problem 2,000 years or <laughs> or 1,000 years, if, the case, <laughs> if that's the kids up being the case. Uh, but a long time from then, we're still dealing with the same issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, verse uh, 13 through 17, uh, I'm going to read the footnotes. It, it might give us a little help as we go through the actual verses. This is the footnotes from the NAB on 13 through 17. The reference to baptism and the contrast with preaching the gospel in verse 17 uh, a, suggests that some Corinthians were paying special allegiance to the individuals who initiated them into the community. Uh, 17b and verse 18, the basic theme in 1 Corinthians 1 through 4 is, is announced in, in, in Corinthians 1 through 4. Uh, adherence to individual leaders has something to do with differences in rhetor rhetorical ability and also with certain presuppositions regarding wisdom, eloquence, and effectiveness at, or their power of speech, which Paul judges to be in conflict with the gospel and the cross. Uh, I said in the introductory remarks uh, last week, I spent about 10 minutes introducing this book, and uh, uh, I'll remind everybody that Corinth was a real, a cosmopolitan place at the time. It had been destroyed a couple of centuries earlier, and now it's rebuilt, and it's, it's the most modern, and it, it's arts and religion and philosophy, and it just, every, that's the, it was the place to be. I compared it to Las Vegas in some ways, and it was very decadent, uh, but more like San Francisco because it was coastal, it was right on the, on the coast. Um, but part of the problem was the people living there, they were very familiar, grew up and were uh, studied all these pagan religions and philosophies. And the problem is that you know, those ideas are being adopted and, in, and, and incorporated into what Paul taught. So you're getting all those ideas brought into this church about sexual liberty, for example. Uh, and they're also very, very impressed with the skillful orator. This is where Paul lacks. Paul even writes. I don't know if you remember if it's in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, but Paul writes that uh, I, I know that I'm not impressive in person, but hopefully my, my letters will impress you. And, uh, so he could write skillfully. Uh, he can really make his point as we, we all are witnessing now uh, 
But when you saw him in person, he was probably slight. He probably bent over and had, maybe had a limp and couldn't see how good out of one eye. And I, I don't know. He, he just was not impressive personally. He didn't have charisma and he wasn't an orator. So they diminished him and they favored someone like Apollos or someone who was, who was more impressive in that way. And that's what these notes here in the uh, NAB are also supporting that conclusion. Uh, so let me read those verses in the KJV first and then get Cripps first to, to respond. Um, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Uh, besides, I, I, I know not whether I baptized any other. Uh, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Mm. So uh, 14 through 17, Brother Cripps. Yeah, so I'm going to make the same point. Again, we're not, we're, he, this is Paul saying to us, look, um, I'm glad that I didn't baptize more people so you, so you wouldn't be lifting me up instead of Christ. I'm glad that I didn't do that named a few people that he baptized, but that was not his focus. His focus was preaching the gospel. So then if Paul's an example for us, what should what should our focus be on? What should our focus be on? It should simply be on the gospel. And um, uh, I love that he's doing this, and I don't understand how these people that lift Paul up in such an elevated place, what, what, what do they say about this particular verse? I mean, and uh, I'll tie it into... Um, Renee's video she did a couple days ago about the hell visit and talking about when Paul is recounting his visit to heaven, he's talking about himself in the per third person so as not to lift himself up. He doesn't want to be followed. He wants us to follow Christ. That's the focus. That's what we should be preaching on, and that's the name that should be lifted up and no other name. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Renee, verse 14 through 17. Yes, uh, and I like that Jason made a point there. He said, yes, our focus should be on the gospel. If water baptism was part of what saved us, I don't think Paul would say, I'm glad God didn't, Jesus didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That should show right there that water baptism is something that's done after salvation not what gets you saved. Mm. Um, and also, I think when it says, I thank God I baptized none of you but Christmas and Gaius, lest any should say I baptized in my own name. I think for an apostle, especially someone that had been in the very presence of Christ, and mm. although Paul wasn't walking in Jesus' earthly ministry, he did see the risen Christ. Yep, He met him, and he said he got the gospel as a revelation directly, was revealed directly to him from Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be a great fear to any of those that have the fear of the Lord in them that someone might lift them up. Like Jason was saying, that's the last thing they want. Like when angels of the Lord say, no, 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 don't worship me. I'm just a servant. Like yep. they, they fear that. And I'm sure this is something that they all feared, that they would be lifted up. Uh, what did Paul say, that I would be lifted up beyond measure or something? Yeah. He didn't want that. Um, and they're doing, uh, again, they're taking their eyes off of Jesus and going off into these sects. And this is a, a, a big deal because there's contentions. It's actually causing division. So all this, see, Satan loves to come in and take the focus off Jesus. So now they're arguing over who did what under who. Mm -hmm instead of being edified and prophesying and studying God's word and getting their faith strengthened, looking up the uh, prophets to confirm all the prophecies Jesus fulfilled, you know, things that'll strengthen their faith. Uh, instead, they're, they're, you know, taking their focus and they're arguing over this stuff. But when he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, that should tell you right there that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That is what saves us. And then when it says not with wisdom of words, the Greeks, they boasted in their philosophical imaginations. You know, like, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? You know, that kind of stuff. 
their philosophical wisdom, their worldly wisdom, their cleverness, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And that is what Paul's talking about when he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none of that. He's telling people simply and plainly who Jesus is, that his work, his death and resurrection were prophesied in, in the ancient scriptures and they have come to life now. Yes. They have been fulfilled. And the simplicity in Christ is that he's paid your sin debt and you now have eternal life through what he's done. And mm. that was the message that he stuck to. Uh, and, and that's what he focuses on. And what I just wanted to explain when it says not with wisdom of words, because there was this area, philosophers were lifted up to celebrity status. Oh, sure. They, they still are, in fact. Oh, yeah. so Socrates awesome. and Plato and, and all those people from that. Uh, when you say they still are, I need to uh, respond because uh, probably the most viewed video I've ever made uh, I got quite irate and fired up. Uh, I think I titled it Lordship Liars, something liars, I believe. And uh, that was one of the earlier videos I made. Uh, but one of the points I made it is that, yes, Crips, they still are. But the philosophers that they're impressed with, the orators they're impressed with today are not the ancient, they're the contemporaries. Uh, when Paul Washer starts weeping and has all this passion, and uh, uh, MacArthur, and, uh, Piper, and, and, uh, and there's a couple of them really that are really very great orators. I make the point in my video, it's, it's not how loudly someone speaks, it's not how eloquently they speak, it's is it the truth that matters. But so many people are so impressed with someone's oratory skills that they're won over and they're not, uh, they get led into these false conclusions. Amen, Brother Luke. Passion is no substitute for truth. Yes, yeah. So I, I'm, and in that video, I, I say, here, let me raise my voice. I, I raise my voice. Does that make what I'm saying true? No. It's what makes it true is it's, it's backed up by what the Bible says. That's how you test it, not the, 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 how loudly I speak. Uh, and then uh, um, I'm going to read those verses in the in the uh, NAB and see how it uh, sounds. I give thanks to God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I baptized the household of Stephanus also. Uh, beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else, uh, for Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel and not with the wisdom of human eloquence so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. Yeah, it's interesting. So what's more important, the truth of what was accomplished on the cross or someone who has great skill at public speaking? All right. Okay, let's go back to the KJV for the next verse. Uh, KJV verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Okay? Uh, I want to tell you, uh, this gentleman... He's a Catholic and he's been contending and he keeps coming back to my channel and he's very polite. So we're, we're working this through. I don't block people just for disagreeing with me. I'm hoping that the conversations we're having is going to answer questions. Uh, and I tell him, you know, we're not, we're not doing this to hurt you. But what I found out is the verse like that unto us, which are saved is always translated in the Catholic Bible as which are being saved saved as if salvation is a process and you can't know if you have it till you die it's based on how you perform your faithfulness yep. so anywhere it's it makes a statement of fact about us that are saved we're saved we're done if you're pulled out of the water and you can fall back in are you saved yet no 
you're not. You're temporarily, you know, you can get a breath, but you're not completely saved because you can fall back in the water. But we are saved, meaning there's no chance of us being lost. We have been saved. But we got to be careful with these new translations. And we already know the Catholic Bible does it where they make salvation a process of being saved. Now, you can be saved from when the Bible says saved. It doesn't always mean from hell or the penalty of sin. You can be saved from the consequence of something. You can be saved from drowning. You know, so you have to look at the context first. But when it's talking about our eternal salvation, it's a done deal. So you should always look at that and be aware in these newer translations if it says being saved. So I want to read this verse now. And it says, um, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, to the Greeks, it was crazy to them. How could some Jewish teacher, rabbi, die and I get heaven? How did, that doesn't make sense to them, right? Um, but also to the work salvationist. They, people say, oh, they, they believe in Jesus, that he died for sins. But no, no, they don't. They don't. Until they believe that his death, burial, and resurrection paid their sin debt and they have eternal life, they have not believed on Jesus. They have not believed the gospel. They are not Christians. They haven't done the first work. And this is what a lot of people think is just semantics, and it's not. So it's foolishness to them also, because they can't see how their own righteousness isn't required. If you say it has nothing to do with how you live. Oh, so I can just rape? That's, that's where they go with it. They can't see people serve and live for God out of love. It's just like a lofty concept that he cannot understand. It's foolishness. How their righteousness isn't required. And so that tells me they're they're probably perishing. If if they're they're probably not saved. If the cross just isn't enough for them and they just can't seem to grasp it and believe it, uh, they're probably not because they're perishing. That's why it's foolishness to them. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Amen. We we know. That what Jesus did, that's the power of God to save me. And I'm trusting in it. You know? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Brother Cripps, I'm going to read this in the Amplified for you. Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness. That is absurd and illogical to those who are perishing and spiritually dead because they reject it. But to those who are being saved by God's grace... It is the manifestation of the power of God. Now, oh, well, I'll let you respond. I, I want to, to respond. Go first. Go ahead, Brother Luke. You go. Renee, um, Renee your point about uh, our saved or uh, we're saved. Or how was it in the KGV again? 18 says, uh, uh, which are saved. Okay. So our means we it's established and then settled. It's present tense, and I can think we can also say that it, we should be able to infer that it's it's it implies that it's future. It's done. It can't be changed. We are saved. Um, so that's that's important. A person has to understand that and believe that. That's essential. Uh, but we also know. I know I've heard you teach on this probably more than anybody else, and so and it is a valid, truthful point that there are these three tenses of salvation. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And you can talk more to differentiate with the meaning of those tenses uh, so everybody can understand it. But uh, it is also uh, hazardous in the Amplified or in any other translation when we do see that they are being saved. The potential problem there is a person will not understand it, that, that they are saved and it's settled. So it, it's a valid point, but also it's also true that we have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Um, uh, so uh, that's it in the Amplified. Brother Cripps, and then, and then Re Renee uh, can respond. Yeah, sure. So it, it, the, the point being made here is, is very, very clear to me. So if a person's spirit is dead, if they haven't been quickened by the Holy Spirit, when they hear about the cross and they hear the things of his word, their eyes are not open, their ears are not open. So, of course, it's foolishness to them. And it's foolishness to those people that are relying on their own works to save them 
and adding it to what Christ has done, because then the cross isn't good enough. It's of no effect for them. Um, so they're perishing. I mean, when we don't get into a point of, of trying to decide who's saved and unsaved, but it's very, very clear they have a tell when they're focused on their own works. It, it's pretty pretty good indicator that they're not resting in the finished work of Christ. They're resting in somehow as if their works need to be done to save them. And I can't impress the point that Renee made enough on you that um, using the analogy of being pulled out of the water, um, if you can fall back in the water, you save. No, it's a tempor temporary safety maybe until you fall back in the water. But that's not the way this works. When you're saved, you're saved. The name of this particular uh, church is a uh, church the eternally secure, eternally secure, meaning you've been saved. You, you, you are not waiting to be saved. Um, now the three tenses, I, I get that you, you were saved. You are being saved. And when we get our eternal body, we'll be saved from the bondage of the flesh and, you know, we'll be made whole in, in those moments. But a person that accepts what Christ did, his finished work is saved they can't fall out of it no matter how uh, how much they sin they're saved and I, I know people have a real hard time with that but um i think i think paul's making a good point here for the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness so if the people that don't understand what we're trying to say and what what paul's trying to say and what the whole of scripture is trying to say then they're i, I fear that they're perishing and it's foolishness to them. They add their own stuff to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Renee, uh, um, we want to talk to you more and respond to the point that I made that um, this this is a, a, a dangerous thing that being saved, a person who doesn't understand, we are saved, we're being saved, we will be saved. They don't understand the, 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 the distinction in these three things. They could take this wrong, come to a bad conclusion. Right. And, and yet, and yet, the modern translations—they're all using that. Right. right. Well, the modern translations are not God's word inspired, and they all have their own agenda and their own theological beliefs that they put into the translation. See, I don't believe their translations. I believe their interpretations. That's mm -hmm. what these things are. In most of these modern versions—they're not. They're not taking uh, the closest translation in English from the original Koine Greek and Hebrew. They are interpreting what they read. That way they can keep getting a new copyright. It has to be a percentage different. But uh, the, the being saved thing, if you think that you have not been saved yet, you haven't believed the gospel. And you need to believe because that's how you are saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And that's you know that's the point that we we talk a lot about uh, this uh, idea of uh, what do you have to believe and what does believe mean and, uh, and what is the content of how you have to believe and it really you have to believe that that uh, you are saved permanently it's settled it's guaranteed it's irrevocable irreversible. You're guaranteed eternal life because of what Jesus did for you and his promise to you. And and if you don't understand that and come to that conclusion, and uh, you're not convinced of that, then you don't understand this gospel. And no wonder you're not jumping for joy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, let me read this in the, uh, the NAB and see how it phrases it. Uh, verse 18 in the it says, um, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So it also has, uh, as you said, uh, but I wouldn't limit it to the term the Catholic Bible. I would say that all the modern translations probably are translating it that way. But let's look now at the uh, the notes in the NAB and see what it says about that portion. It says um, um, the, the basic theme of 1 Corinthians. Oh, uh, no, OK. The wrong point there, uh, 17b. Let's turn the word. 
Well, let me just read this portion here. It's back to the previous verse, but 17b, the footnote is, not with the wisdom of human eloquence. Both of the nouns employed here involve several levels of meaning on which Paul deliberately plays as his thought unfolds. Wisdom, which is Sophia, may be philo philosophical and speculative, but in biblical usage, the term primarily denotes practical knowledge, such as is demonstrated in the choice and effectiveness, effective application of, uh, of means to achieve an end. Uh, the same term can uh, designate the arts uh, of a building. First uh, Corinthians 3.10, they say is an example of that. Uh, or, or persuasive speaking, or effectiveness in achieving salvation. Uh, eloquence, uh, of logos, of the, of, that means of your words, this translation emphasizes one possible meaning of the term logos, the references to rhetorical style and persuasiveness in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 4, but the term itself may denote an internal reasoning process, plan or intention, as well as an in external word, speech or message. So by expression, uk and sophia logu, uh, that's my bad Greek way of saying it, in the context of gospel preaching, Paul may intend to exclude both human ways of reasoning or thinking about things and human rhetorical technique. Uh, human, this adjective, oops, that's where the notes uh, are cut off I, when I pasted them here. Human, this adjective does not stand in the Greek text, but is supplied, all right, I'll have to go back and get more of those notes. But, uh, okay, uh, before we go to the next verse, which is, uh, let me see, 19, any, any thoughts on anything I just said there? Okay, I'll go to verse 19 in the KJV. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Brother Cripps? Yes. Um, I believe this is, this is a moment in time that I will just be delighted to see all the people that have considered themselves wise. And as I referred to the older uh, Socrates and Plato and all the stuff, what I, what I meant by that is that in the world and certainly in academia, they're still following the things that were said by these, these older quote unquote learned men and holding uh, up the other, other uh, writings, including the Bible to scrutiny based on, on their writings and their sayings. Um, they're in systems, they're in hospital systems, they're in governmental systems, or it, it's, it's still all over the place. Look at those philosophies. So those wisdoms of the, of the so-called wise are, are going to be brought to nothing when compared to uh, Scripture. And, and I believe we have Scripture, we have the true wisdom here in, in, the, in the pages of his word. And uh, we don't have to rely on these false wisdoms. We can rely on the wisdom of God that's written for us. And he states it, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Um, I can't wait till this happens when it's a public display, when everyone sees him and understands that, that they've been foolish. Um, but we can cling to his word now. We don't have to listen to even the contemporaries, Brother Luke, or the Paul Washers and the, and the people that are out there today that are following, we don't have to follow any man. We can simply follow Christ, simply dive into his word and use that as a means to grow wisdom, which in, in Proverbs 3 talks about how uh, precious wisdom is, precious more than any kind of treasure uh, known to man. And we can find that ourselves. We don't have to listen to any contemporaries. Okay, thanks. Uh, Renee, uh, verse uh, 18, uh, and uh, it's interesting, and in it says, it is written. It's Old Testament. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. trying to find where it's written. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the learning of the learned I will set aside. It's not a, it's Isaiah. You know where it is? I thought it was Isaiah. I could be wrong. 
Okay. I, I'm the worst at remembering exactly where stuff is. Okay. Uh, it right, made, made me. Uh, I'll see if I can find it though. If you don't find it, um, I love Jason when you said I, I can't wait till all these. You know, like Stephen Hawking. So he's too smart for God. No. You know, going to find out how the Earth sustains itself and life was created. We're just going to get God out of the equation. I'm too smart for God. Had a guy come to atheist come to my channel today just to do you guys just believe whatever you're told. And I was like, Oh, and you made up evolution, I guess. Yeah. You just got you just ate what you were fed in the public school system. So you're no yeah. you know, great thinker yourself. So <laughs> it just trips me out that he might also be talking about the religious Pharisees that could memorize the entire law and the prophets yep. they memorize them and where is their wisdom it they can't they have no godly spiritual wisdom right it's only the carnal wisdom of scripture there's a lot of false preachers that can quote the bible backwards and forwards and they have yep. no wisdom from god just no revelation and and jesus told us that we have to be as little children and just like he said, it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven. Uh, it's not because rich people are evil. It's because they never feel their need for God. Their money yeah. always answers their questions. Their security is in their money. Yeah. And it's the same thing with people that think they're really smart. Uh, they they don't need God. They got it all figured out. They've got the answers. They're going to find another way. And and the religious, you know, they 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 think they know what God's word said, but Jesus said, we got to be his little children and little children say, uh, I don't know. My, my dad loves me. That's all I know. And I trust in him. And he said, he saved me. So I believe him. And that's yep. the faith of a little child. Yep. It does not have to be complicated. Salvation isn't complicated. So all of that wisdom, all that worldly knowledge, it's worthless when it comes to salvation Amen. for us to, understand scripture and once we've been saved that god can show us revelation but that's his wisdom through the scriptures you know to see deeply into these things that's but, it. Uh, i really think a, a lot of people think they're just too smart for god and the religious they they get so hung up on their ritual and their tradition and their works that they they complicate it and they so i when he says i will destroy the wisdom of the wise uh, you know, like I said earlier, the Greek philosopher is like, what? Some dead Jewish rabbi died so I get heaven? That doesn't even make sense. Yeah. So to them, it, it doesn't make sense. And then you got the religious. It doesn't make sense to them either. Right. Is there oh, a did you find it, Luke? Mm -hmm. No, okay, I, can't, I don't know where it is. But you try to find it while Crips okay. is explaining verse, uh, uh, that portion to us. Uh, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom. Oh, let me read it in the Amplify and see how it's stated there for you. Uh, verse. Uh, okay. Uh, or what was that for? 18? No, okay. So, yeah, already, already. 19. Yeah. Uh, and the Amplify says, for it is written and forever remains written. I got it. Okay. I it is an Isaiah, but it's worded a little bit different. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Because, you know, Paul and even Jesus, they took some liberties. They did not necessarily. Yeah, they them. didn't do it word for word. Kind of paraphrase it. Go ahead. Uh, so Isaiah 29, 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. See, so um, this makes me feel a lot better. I think we talked about this before. The fact that uh, I, I tend to paraphrase a lot. I mean, there's a lot of verses. I, I don't really make an attempt to memorize verses, uh, but there's a lot of verses that I've read and said so many times that I do have them memorized. And then there's many others that I'm familiar with and I can, I pretty much paraphrase it pretty closely, and so I do a lot of paraphrasing. And uh, uh, I'll always, uh, I'll try to say that I'm paraphrasing, so a person doesn't think I'm trying to quote it and I'm quoting it incorrectly. But 
uh, I think we should all feel like we do have that freedom to paraphrase, even though quoting the scripture would be better. But yeah. Jesus and Paul paraphrase numerous times uh, when they're quoting, not quoting, but referencing Old Testament scriptures. They're paraphrasing it and putting it into more contemporary words, maybe like we're doing. Uh, that was okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we have the, the freedom to do that too. Brother Cripps? Oh. Let me read it in the Amplified for you. Uh, see if it's uh, 19. Uh, for it is written and forever remains written. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. That is the philosophy of the philosophers and the cleverness of the clever who do not know me. I will nullify. Well, I, I already responded to 19, but the, the amp, I will nullify, that's huge. Um, that puts it in perspective. So these, these, these men, including the contemporaries that are preaching a false gospel and they're leading, trying to lead people astray from, from the one gospel, um, they'll be nullified. And that works with Isaiah too, the, the way that Isaiah, uh, Isaiah read. They'll be uh, use the word hidden. Uh, nullified is way stronger, uh, but both mean the same thing. They'll, they'll be put aside. They won't be remembered. They'll be proved uh, false. And then all that will be left is the wisdom of God. We'll be able to embrace that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to suggest that we uh, uh, do verse 20 uh -huh. for tonight and end on that uh, because uh, it's about that time for you back east. Uh, and also... Uh, the first, last week we did 10 verses, tonight we'll do 10 and there'll be 11 remaining, so maybe it'll work out that uh, each week we can get through uh, 10 or 11 verses and, and finish this chapter uh, next time. Um, plus, there's a couple of things I want to say in closing that uh, I want to save a little bit of time for. So let me read the KJV for verse 20 and uh, rather... Crips, you can go first on this one. Okay. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? <laughs> yeah, where are they? They're in dusty books in every academia library all over the place. There, I mean, you can you can pull them up and and uh, um, when I when I was in school, this is this is all I heard. All I heard was the wisdom of these dead these dead uh, philosophers. Um, now I did take a philosophy class, so obviously I was I was asking for it. Um, but it's it's amazing how much stock they put into these things. They're saying, "Where are they?" And then, again, that ties into uh, what Isaiah was saying. They'll be hidden. All these all these foolish words that are spoken against Scripture, the words of the world, the things that the world embraces. And um, I, I would say right now, the way the world's looking right now, they're not even looking for worldly wisdom. They're just they're looking for other things. They're looking to to have a smart house and a smart car and a, and a, and a smart uh, uh, dog and everything's all connected to the Internet. And, and the, you know, they just want their life to be easy and comfortable and convenient. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people are even looking for wisdom. Um, but the wisdom uh, hath, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for us that believe scripture and understand that only his truth is truth and everything else. Um, there may be some wisdoms out there that hit on some truth. I mean, all the other religions, they have truth mixed with lies. And as we've said on this broadcast before, if you, if you take, uh, a glass of water and it's 99% pure and 1% poison, it's poison. Bottom line. So his wisdom is pure, unadulterated truth. Or as Jesus said, a, live, a little leaven, leaven mm -hmm. the whole lump. Amen. 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 You cannot mix a little bit of work with the blood of Jesus or it's adulterated. It has no saving power. Uh, Renee, go ahead. Yeah, I did a video yesterday called The Gospel Even Fascinates the Angels. I saw it. And 
there is uh, something what, like the way Isaiah puts it. It says, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of the wise men shall perish mm. and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. So how many times have you heard people like the Pope say the cross was a failure or Jesus was the biggest failure in the Bible or uh, Muslims deny the crucifixion of Jesus because that they think that makes him not a prophet because God would never let one of his prophets be killed. Mm. Right. Well, I guess they didn't read the rest of the Old Testament, but they were killed. Every one of them was killed. But, All the day long. Uh, but that is man's wisdom. When Peter said, far be it from you, God, uh, Jesus. Remember, he said, I, I must die. I'm going to be betrayed, taken in by the priest, and they're going to have me killed. And he said, no, no, no. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, because the wisdom of this world is at enmity with God. It's Ooh. different. God's ways are higher than our ways, and they must be revealed through the Holy Spirit. It will make no sense. First Peter even says that the gospel is something the angels desire to look into. It says, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that has preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So God's wisdom destroys the wisdom of the wise of this world. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think it's a hindrance uh, to most. Okay. Uh, so I'll read that in the Amplified uh, next. Verse 20 in the Amplified is, uh, where is the wise man, the philosopher, where is the scribe, the scholar? Where is the debater, the logician, or the orator and of this age? Has God not exposed the foolishness of this world's wisdom? Mm. Yeah, I think they did an excellent job. And Amplified, as I said, 99.5% of the time, it, it does a good job and is helpful. But that's why we got to continue to test it against the KJV and against uh, the the um, repent of your sins thing, you know, uh, getting in there somehow. Um, let me read it in the NAB. Uh, it says, um, where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the wisdom of the world foolish? All right, so I think they're all in agreement and it, it's, um, uh, the point is, is made. But the notes uh, on that portion are interesting, I think. Um, well, I, I I read the notes about that already that last time about about wisdom. But um, okay, I I guess that will be the end of this the text study for tonight. But I want to I want to mention a couple of people and uh, and uh, also refer back. Remember the very beginning tonight, I referenced Brother Leo Larson and um, him telling me about this NAB uh, RE, New American Bible Revised Edition. Um, now, uh, we got into a conversation about some of these footnotes and how helpful it, it is to him. And he, he said, um, he started talking about Barabbas. And you know, I, uh, I have a playlist titled um, The Bloody Trail, Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. Uh, if someone uh, really understands the New Testament, then you're ready to go back and read the Old Testament because you won't understand the Old Testament unless you first understand the New. Sorry, it's backwards. That's the way it is. Uh, but if you understand the New Testament and what was accomplished with Jesus' shed blood, you read the Old Testament and you'll see all these pictures uh, of, of this shed blood of Jesus. Um, and I probably have on that playlist maybe 20, I'm guessing, 20 examples uh, of these pictures and shadows of Jesus' shed blood. And, uh, and he mentions something that uh, I didn't catch before that I thought was really really interesting and uh, he, he says you know uh, when 
Barabbas and Jesus were there, Pontius Pilate, who gave everybody a choice. Um, well, Barabbas was set free, and Jesus was the one that was sentenced to death. Barabbas was the, the sinner, the likely one, the mm -hmm. one that everybody should agree. He's the one that should be punished. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows he's a thief and a murderer. He deserves to die, but he was set free. I never connected it. That's a picture of us being set free from condemnation and Jesus dying in, in our place. Wow. But another thing, he said, do you know Barabbas' first name? Nope. Anybody know Barabbas' first name? Nope. Uh, did you know Barabbas was his last name, first of all? When I, uh, all these years reading Barabbas, um, I never really thought, is that his first name or his last name? It, I assumed it. called his Barabbas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I said, well, I didn't think about him having a first name. And, I, and, they, and I'm thinking, could it be Jesus? And he says, yes, it's Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. And I said, wow, not only does that blow me away, but here's something, uh, Leo. Uh, the, the prefix bar, B-A-R, in the Bible means son of. When, we, when the Bible says Simon bar Jonah, it means Simon, son of Jonah. So what does Barabbas mean? It means son of Abba, father. Son of Abba, the father. G and Barabbas' name, it's Jesus Barabbas, it's Jesus, son of the father. Wow. That is amazing. Now that he found, let me go to this, uh, this uh, uh, NAB here, second. Uh, While you're looking for that, I just want to slip this in really quickly. I have wondered whether Barabbas uh, became a believer after having been let go and watching what happened with, uh, with Jesus Christ, not Barabbas. Um, just one of those one of those questions I had. I also wondered often if the um, Roman soldiers that crucified Christ, if there was any transformation of their hearts. Okay. Uh, let's look at this portion in Matthew 27 that talks about Barabbas and see if I can find those footnotes here that he's referencing. Uh, Here's the footnotes on that chapter. Well, there's quite a bit there, but let me just get to the Barabbas part. Um, it says, the choice that Pilate offers the crowd between Barabbas and Jesus is said to be in accordance with the custom of releasing at, at the Passover feast one prisoner chosen by the crowd. This custom is mentioned also in Mark and John, uh, but not in Luke. Uh, outside of the Gospels, there's no direct attest, attestation of it, and scholars are divided in their judgment of this historical reliability of the claim that there was such a practice. Now it says, Jesus Barabbas, referring to uh, 27, verse 16 and 17, says, Jesus Barabbas. It is possible that the double name is the original reading. Jesus was a common Jewish name. Uh, this reading is found in only a few textual witnesses, although its absence in the majority can be explained as an omission of, of Jesus made for reverential reasons. That name is bracketed because of its uncertain textual at attestation. The Aramaic name Barabbas means son of the father. The irony of the choice offered between him and Jesus, the true son of the father, would be evident to those addressed, addressed in Matthew. Um, so the point here I'm making is that in talking to Brother Leo last night, and I'm, um, as I said, I commend him and encourage everybody to do the same thing. Let's study in your own private studies more seriously and taking really going into a little deeper. Look at the Greek if it'll help you as Brother um, uh, Michael Ultimate Mordecai has uh, demonstrated to everybody. Uh, look at other translations, and this particular translation, the New American Bible Revised Edition, 
ironically. I said, he says, you'll never guess. It's going to blow you away what Bible it is. It is the official Roman Catholic Bible. Isn't this amazing? It's shocking that this Bible can have uh, this, the way it's translated and the footnotes on uh, that you know, we are getting from it. Uh, they're there for the Roman Catholics. The problem is not that the Roman Catholics do not have the truth. The problem is Roman Catholics will not read their Bible. Yeah. Ironic okay. indeed. Yeah. So uh, any uh, reaction to that from anybody? Uh, yeah. I, I, well, my first my first reaction is is uh, Brother Leo saying that the the I mean I haven't looked at it other than what you just read is he saying that it's that it's accurate that he feels like it's accurate? Well, yeah. This well, version, I mean, well, let's just let's just say that it's helpful, like all like like looking at the other translations, uh, I, and and um, because not only because of the way it's translated that he's finding helpful, but right. the footnotes are so comprehensive, more so than anything I've seen. Okay. Uh, yeah, the 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 in it, the, the um, amplified translation that we've been using mm -hmm. does have some footnotes that are usually helpful. Right. But, the, but it pales in comparison as far as the depth of the footnotes that, that are available. Gotcha. So uh, I think that for that reason uh, alone, it can be valuable. Mm -hmm. it gets some insights that we wouldn't get. Brother Lou, yeah. I was thinking as soon as you said Greek, I was like, well, bar. Uh, means son of, because that's when he said Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. And then I said, Abba, that's father. I said, son of the father. But you know what I'm wondering? If Barabbas is a generic name for someone without a legitimate father, Ooh. like the other guy was an illegitimate one, and the world chose the illegitimate son over the true son, and that was a shadow. Wow. That's interesting too. Yeah. That sure is. Yeah, but uh, the point I'm trying to make here is um, I'm happy Brother Leo is uh, doing so well, and he's, he's awesome in his knowledge and understanding. And uh, I encourage everybody to do the same. And uh, he's shown me that uh, this particular translation can be useful in our mm -hmm. studies. Uh, but again, as I said. Uh, I trust the KJV as, as our scriptures, and I test everything against it, but that doesn't mean that other translations and other footnotes cannot be helpful to us. He should do a video on that. One of y'all should. That's a that's a great find. Yeah. Okay, maybe I will. Um, Brother Leo's working real hard on another song for us. Uh, awesome. He should, he's out in the middle. These songs don't come overnight for him. You know, they're, I believe that uh, they're inspired. So go to his channel. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Psalms of Grace is the name of Brother Leo's channel. While I'm recommending channels, I want to also recommend I added two more channels um, yesterday to the the list I have on my homepage. It says um, License to Rest above it. And there's, I think, seven channels now on it that I'm um, uh, recommending because they're entirely uh, Christian channels and they are really doing an excellent job. I added Brother Dave, um, Brother Dave. I mentioned him recently. I said I think he's the best preacher right now on YouTube that I've, that I've seen. When I say preacher, the distinction is uh, we're teaching, but we're not necessarily preaching. Preaching is delivered in an oratorical, passionate way, and it has more power passion <laughs> involved. Uh, preaching, preaching also can also cause conviction. Whereas teaching is not necessarily there to convict someone, uh, but so uh, brother Dave, I've added his his name, uh, his channel, and another one that I just discovered, uh, Patrick Step, um, has sent me a, a, a video and asked me if I would check out this channel and endorse it or not, and and the channel is uh, David Benjamin in Christ. So the last week I've been looking at his videos, and the first thing I noticed is that he has a playlist titled James Trouble. James Trouble? What could he, what could he mean by that? So I watched all his videos on James Trouble, and all of his teaching and conclusions completely mirror 
all of the things that I've been saying on my playlist, James and Paul, the shocking facts. So uh, even though we don't know each other, uh, we just got to getting to know each other uh, independently. We both studied this and come to the same conclusions about this book of James. So that got me very intrigued and I started watching his other videos. Right now he's currently teaching verse by verse on the book of Hebrews. He's on chapter seven now. He's an outstanding Bible teacher. So I hope that uh, everybody will subscribe to uh, uh, David Benjamin in Christ. Okay. Um, other than that, um, let's take a couple of minutes now just to kind of sum up our thoughts on the, the study tonight. Uh, Brother Cripps, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I like where he went with this. I like that he is pointing uh, as, as uh, last week, uh, each of the scriptures was had Jesus name in them. And then, uh, then these this follow up this week. Then he starts talking about what the problem is, and he he's saying uh, he's not lifting himself up. He's lifting up the name of Christ and making it very very clear uh, that we're not uh, uh, we we're not saved by Paul. We're not saved by Peter. We're not saved by any other person. And uh, then he doubles down and says we're not saved by the wisdom of the world. And that um, God will uh, make all the wisdom of the world um, foolish. So it's the opposite of what people in the world think. They think that we're foolish. Um, they think that by believing in what Christ did, believing in some some guy that lived two thousand years ago, uh, is somehow the savior of the world. That's foolish. Uh, when actually, it's it's the world wisdom that's foolish. And um, I appreciate the study, and I cannot wait until next week. This is a, this is a great book thus far, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yep. <coughs> okay, Renee, the first problem uh, that Paul points out that's going on in this church is these people identifying with some, yep. uh, you know, uh, popular apostles or disciples instead of identifying with Christ. The churches should have read more scripture. Yeah, uh, it's ironic that, that 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 we didn't learn from these early problems. Every problem they addressed in the first century still happening two thousand years later. Yep, still happening. So it, it's but what I'm finding interesting is we are finding wisdom and better understanding and nuggets and little treasures in these little like salutation verses. You know, like even in their salutation, we saw where he said to you at, at Corinth, who are kept by the power of God, preserved by the power of God, like little things within the salutation that most people just skip over to get to the meat. Yeah, I did. Finding deep stuff in them. I'm, I'm guilty of that, Renee. It's, it's really going, going back. Yeah, and, yeah it, it's it, it was a mistake, but I've done that in my past of of in going back and reading the books and skipping over any of that, skipping over the genealogy. I mean, I've read them before, but when going back and reading certain books again, skip over parts that I didn't want. Oh, I wanted to dig into other things. And it's really a mistake. I, I, I love that we're finding stuff like that. Even with the genealogies, when you look at them in the Hebrew names, you know, there's messages in them. Oh, I know. I get that now. But, but uh, Masiba, Masiba Chef, I never say his name right. That story, you know, where he's living, it means without grace or something where he's living. And then David brings him to his table. It's a, it, it's something that's what's so great about God's word is there's so many layers to it. Amen. You know, and I like studying it with you guys. I always learn something. Yeah, me too. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, well, we, we talked about uh, this problem, uh, as Renee said, we, we keep making this point that the problems we find uh, throughout, well, in the gospel accounts, you have the Pharisees, we got Pharisees today, in all the epistles, we have all, all the false doctrines coming in and uh, the, all, all these different uh, disputes that uh, you find charges against Paul being uh, antinomian and with these charges are all coming against all of us today who are teaching the free gift instead of works. Um, and, and so um, all the problems are ancient. 
And, and this particular problem here that Paul mentions about belonging to Cephas, belonging to, to uh, Apollos instead of belonging to Christ. Um, this is uh, not only can it be demonstrated with famous people like uh, Luther, Calvin, but we got famous t contemporaries, MacArthur, Piper, Washer, Comfort. Uh, people are identifying with them instead of with Jesus. And we even have, even in this great community that we love here on the internet, we have factions. We've had people who've been with us and broken off and gone on to their own factions. And, and yeah. people are identifying with that group rather than another group. Yeah. And it's still going on. The same problems of div dividing and because you want to follow another person maybe they have a different personality or yeah. they prefer and it's just it's it's horrible but mm -hmm. but there's over thirty thousand denominations so that should tell us that there is a problem and that's why uh, i'm just saying can we just unify around jesus is eternal god almighty please god the flesh he's not merely a great man or a prophet he's god manifest in the flesh can we unify around salvations of free gift because of our faith in jesus finished work on the cross his promise of eternal life to us rather than faith in our own ability to earn it through works yes. can we unify on the fact that when he gives us the gift of eternal life it really is eternal it's we have eternal security it's guaranteed never to be taken away from us yeah. and then all other theological subjects we can argue with charity in a loving way you know and, and learn from each other but have freedom we don't have to agree on 97 percent just this little three points and if we could all do that, we wouldn't have to have 30,000 denominations. All right. Thank you for joining us tonight and joining us again uh, uh, every Wednesday for this Wednesday night Bible study. We're also this Friday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, we have the Fellowship Friday. And, and on that, it's, it's a unique program in that I put the link to join the panel. I post it publicly so anybody who does agree with these three core doctrines can click on that link and join the, the group discussion. Uh, we don't want anybody in the group discussion, though, who doesn't agree with the core doctrines of Christianity, because Fellowship Friday means we're having fellowship. A fellowship can't take place between a non-believer and a believer. You can be friends with non-believers, but fellowship can only be among those who share this faith. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Renee and, and, and Cripps. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.